tonight on CBC Vancouver News. Premier Horgan could cap the motor fuel tax anytime he wants to and reduce the price of gasoline at the pumps. Politics at the pump. Can the BC government really do anything about our soaring gas prices also? It's quite shocking uh, to see that type of like uh, hatred kind of being spewed out in such a public way. A man arrested after a threatening post about a pressure cooker bomb at Surrey's Visaki parade. And... Just last week I waited uh, two hours for it. Overcrowding, delays, skip stops, TransLink's top rider complaints, and which routes they're on. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening. BC's opposition leader thinks there's a way to save you about $5 the next time you fill up your gas tank. And with prices at the pump sky high, Andrew Wilkinson says Premier Horgan has the power to do it. As Provincial Affairs reporter Tanya Fletcher tells us, it's all about capping taxes. When it comes to our sky-high gas prices... The companies, I mean, it's definitely with the refineries. There's no shortage of blame. Government? Gas, uh, gas companies? To go around. The tax that the province charges is extraordinarily high. And that's exactly what political opponents are saying, zeroing in on John Horgan's hint of help in early April. We'll see how it goes through the summer, and if there's an opportunity uh, to uh, have the province step in and help, we'll do that. It fueled critics who claim the Premier does have the power to help, and that help should come before the peak summer driving season, not after. BC Liberal leader Andrew Wilkinson claims there are two ways the province could stave off steep prices. In term repairing BC's relationship with Alberta and in the short term capping provincial fuel taxes which right now total about 35 cents a litre. What John Horgan could do is say look we're going to make the carbon tax revenue neutral again and give it back to you on your income taxes. The other thing he can do with a stroke of a pen is put a cap on motor fuel tax so that we can afford to go to the gas station again. With the flick of a pen the former Liberal government could have done a whole bunch of things. Not that long ago he was saying it was a market driven issue that required a market solution now he wants intervention. But how much difference would capping the motor fuel tax actually make? On average, about five bucks a fill-up. Cue the argument that the carbon tax was brought in by the former B.C. Liberal government. Wilkinson says it was not designed to withstand the sticker shock of surge pricing. The idea with the carbon tax was it would slowly change and people would buy more efficient vehicles. And that's exactly what's happened in B.C. over the last 12 years. The problem with surges in prices is people can't make these adaptations. But taxes aren't the problem, argues Horgan, who says high prices are because of price gouging by oil companies and supply issues. Experts are saying we're hearing that it's about refining capacity. There's not enough gasoline and there's too, much, too many people chasing it. That's a market problem. We have to work to fix that. But with no quick fix in sight, drivers are left paying for it at the pump no matter which way the finger points. Tanya Fletcher, CBC News, Vancouver. Well, the numbers are in. Turns out TransLink ridership reached an all-time high across the board last year. TransLink experienced a 7.1% jump in the system-wide ridership. It's the biggest ever annual increase. It also identified 52 routes with overcrowding. To compensate in the short term, it's adding service hours to 32 of them in the next two months. Over the next three years, TransLink says it will add 620,000 bus service hours. There will be over 350 additions to the bus fleet. 56 cars will be added to the Expo and Millennium line, and 24 cars added to the Canada line to increase capacity. The demand is growing faster than we're able to put out service, so people are commenting on that. And as Mayor Cote pointed out, um, we've got the ability over the next two or three years to continue to pour more and more bus service out there. But if we're going to continue to be successful in this region and draw more market share into our system, you know, that level of crowding is going to be part of it's It's the reality of a really, really good thriving transit system. So you just heard him call overcrowding a, a reality of a good transit system, but it doesn't seem like riders agree. In fact, overcrowding actually tops the list of TransLink grievances. Rafferty Baker has more on the 10 bus routes generating the most complaints last year. There were more than 29,000 complaints about TransLink bus trips in 2018. In the context of um, well over 400 million boardings, uh, 29,000 complaints is actually a fairly 
small number. Every complaint is important and we follow up on all of the complaints. The route with the highest number of complaints is the 319 from Scott Road Station to the Newton Exchange, where there was a 24% increase in boardings compared to 2017. The 116 in Burnaby was number two, followed by the 410 and the 301, both ending at Brighouse Station in Richmond. The complaints, though, came from all over the region. I took a ride on the second most complained about route, the 116 from Metrotown. So it should be peak rush hour and the bus is almost completely emptied out. But soon the passengers began to board. It's getting a little more crowded, so we're gonna have to move to the back of the bus. There's a little bit of space back here, but this bus is filled right up. That particular ride didn't see any skipped stops, but passengers on board had plenty of complaints. It's not on schedule. Right, so like for instance, this bus was about nine minutes late. It's always very packed, the lines are always crazy, and um, sometimes the bus just goes right past you. Yeah, you've yeah. had that where it's... Oh yeah, that happens, that happens quite frequently. How does it feel when you see that? Uh, it kind of sucks, especially after a long day of work. Over in Richmond, there are similar complaints from 301 riders. That route was ranked fourth. On the weekends, it's not good. And even though like if you miss a bu one bus, it's like one in one hour. The thing with the 301 is it comes in every one hour to on one hour, one hour, 30 minutes. And it wouldn't be surprising for people to rank it because there's always a big line for it. And at the third ranked 410. Just last week, I waited uh, two hours for it. TransLink says the complaints they get include driver behavior, service issues and schedules. But mostly it's related to overcrowding there are more complaints about overcrowding, there are more complaints about pass-ups. The fact is that we are, the demand is growing faster than we're able to put out service, so people are commenting on that. TransLink says overcrowding is an issue on the 99B line and SkyTrain network too, but people don't seem to complain as much about those lines. The SkyTrain got just about 3,000 complaints last year. Rafferty Baker, CBC News, Burnaby. Ottawa and the province have announced plans to further widen Highway 1 through Langley. Construction is already underway, but now an extra 10 kilometers will be widened. It's the road between 216th and 264th, adding an HOV lane in each direction. Crews will also construct a new truck parking lot near Highway 1 and Highway 17. The feds and province will each chip in about $100 million for the project, with the township of Langley giving $27 million for the upgrades. As for more widening out towards Abbotsford, the government says it's working on it. What we're saying today, and Premier Organ was saying as well, uh, let's take it in, in chunk that we can, uh, we can do now because it's important to, to get going with some segment of it that's going to allow for more fluidity, more mobility, uh, security as well, because it's not only about twinning about 10 kilometers of road, it's about also providing more safety. Delta's mayor ran on the promise of replacing the Massey Tunnel with a bridge, but it seems George Harvey has found a new solution to the city's commuting problem. Harvey now says the plan is to build a bigger tunnel featuring six lanes for regular traffic, two lanes for buses and space for cyclists and pedestrians. Vancouver, Richmond, Surrey and White Rock support the plan, as have local First Nations. Don't expect congestion to ease anytime soon, though. If the plan goes forward, it would take years before anything is built. A man found guilty of fatally stabbing a taxi passenger has been sentenced to two years probation for manslaughter. The incident dates back to February of 2014. Kenneth Williams was arguing with the taxi driver when the cab's passenger got out of the car and joined the dispute. He was stabbed and later died. The BC Prosecution Service says the judge would have sentenced Williams to six years in jail for the offense, but he noted he'd served six years and seven months in remand. And as a result, he was sentenced to one day in jail, two years probation with conditions. BC's police watchdog is sending a report to Crown to consider charges in a police-involved crash last summer. It happened on a Friday evening in downtown Vancouver at the corner of Smythe and Howe. Two women, both in their 30s, were hit and injured. Three officers were also hurt in the crash. Vancouver police said at the time they were responding to a call with lights and sirens. It will be up to the B.C. prosecution to decide if charges should be laid.
A man has been arrested in connection with an online threat alluding to a violent act at the Surrey Vasaki parade. Now, as Tina Lovegreen reports, organizers and police are reassuring the public the event is a safe one. <laughs> Over half a million people flooded the streets of Surrey for this year's Visaki Parade. A record high turnout that made headlines. But it also attracted hateful comments. Yesterday, we told you a Facebook user made a post alluding to a potential violent act. That post has since been removed, and CBC News won't repeat the comment. But it has put the community on edge. Concern and fear for sure, uh, and I, I think there's no downplaying that. Uh, the fear comes from like recent incidents like Christchurch and other things that have happened around the world. Now police say they've arrested a 46-year-old man in Surrey. This person was arrested um, for public incitement of hatred, so uh, that's what they're being investigated for currently. Charges haven't been approved yet. Whether or not it leads to a conviction, I guess we'll have to wait and see, but you know, to think of cases, you know, they, they, they are infrequent. Infrequent, but a case that criminal lawyer Paul Doroshenko says is important. Things that that um, you know, promote hatred, uh, we we we're not supposed to have a tolerance for those things in our society. So you know, I'm glad to see that the police are taking this seriously. And organizers of the parade say they work with police to ensure the event is safe. And following this incident, they will look into whether they need to beef up security for next year. We want to assure people that, you know, it's one of the safest places to be. In a 20-year history, we've had, like, no major incident. Um, and we'll continue to, like, do our best to protect people uh, with the police and security services. And police want to encourage people to report hateful or unlawful comments that have no place at an event that aims to bring people together. Tina Lovegreen, CBC News, Surrey. Almost a week after a deck collapsed during a party at a Langley home, nine people are still in hospital and two of them are in serious condition. More than 100 people were there for a pre-wedding celebration last Friday when the deck gave way. A total of 18 people were taken to hospital. The bride's mother told CBC the nine in hospital are family members and their injuries range from broken bones to head trauma. The bride was also standing on the deck when it collapsed, but she was not injured. The wedding went ahead as planned the next day. The owner of a Washington state bed and breakfast is out on bail following allegations he helped people cross into Canada illegally. Robert Goulet faces 21 counts under the Canadian Immigration Act for, quote, inducing, aiding or abetting seven people to enter the country. Goulet is the well-known face behind the Smugglers Inn which is located on the border in Blaine, Washington. The proprietor's release came with a number of conditions, including that he erect a four by eight foot sign near the border, warning people that it's illegal to enter Canada from this property. A woman is facing multiple charges after being arrested at YVR in connection to a ring of thieves that travels from airport to airport. 60 year old Miriam Fajardo, who is not a resident of Canada, is facing a total of nine charges, including three counts of theft under $5,000. She was arrested last week when officers saw her allegedly stealing a purse from a passenger in the International Arrivals Terminal at the airport. Police say Fajardo could be responsible for more thefts and that other law enforcement agencies are investigating her as well. They're reminding travelers to keep a close eye on belongings and to report any suspicious activity to police. Brett Sauter Home is here now with our first check of the forecast. Another beautiful day out there today, Brett. Yes, it really was. I mean, especially the morning hours. I know there was a lot of sun. And since then, if you look around me now, it's probably clouded over a fair bit, no matter where you are across the lower mainland. And there's a really good reason for this. If you actually want to take a look at one of our satellite and radar maps that I put together here, um, rather, it's going to be this one back there. There we go. Yeah, we're seeing a lot of cloud cover coming on in. And this is just making its way over from the mountains over on Vancouver Island. And this is actually going to be allowing those temperatures throughout the overnight period to not get nearly as cold as they were this morning. I think it got down to maybe about 
about four degrees. Now we're not seeing anything on the radar, fortunately. There's no significant precipitation on the way, though we are going to be expecting temperatures tomorrow afternoon to be right around seasonal. So widespread across the region, we're going to be looking at daytime highs anywhere between 13, 14, maybe even pushing 15 degrees. Now that said, we've got still quite a lot of sun in the forecast. If you're going to take a look at this next map I've got prepared for you, no matter where you are in the south coast of BC, you're going to be dealing with a lot of sunshine. Now we've got temperatures, of course, a little bit cooler on the island, and especially if you're heading up into higher elevation areas such as Whistler, we could be looking at temperatures right around 13 degrees. But for the vast majority of us that are going to be sitting in and around the lower mainland, lots of sunshine is going to be on the way. Now keep that in mind as I talk to you a little bit later on about the rain that could potentially interrupt some of your partying plans if you've got anything going on late on Friday night and into Saturday morning. More on that coming up. No, always with the bad news, Brad. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thanks. We'll see you later. Yep. Yeah. A new $126 million facility on SFU's Surrey campus opened today, dedicated to sustainable energy engineering. Starting this September, SFU will introduce a new sustainable energy engineering degree program. The program is unique to Western Canada. Students will learn to work in clean technology sectors, such as smart cities, clean power generation, and sustainable food and water solutions. Future looks bright. Students are going to solve complex challenges to sustain our environment, to protect our environment. There are, there are going to be jobs of tomorrow that we haven't even thought of that are going to come out of this building. The project was funded in large part by the federal and provincial governments, with both providing $45 million. SFU and its donors chipped in with $26 million and SFU provided the land, which was valued at $10 million. Well, it's been a year and a half since the province announced a plan to build 2,000 modular housing units to address homelessness in BC. Today, more than half of those units have been built, with 960 occupied. But Jesse Johnson is finding out how much of a difference this all really makes with thousands of people still on the streets. BC has three big problems. Housing is expensive, thousands of people have died from overdoses during the opioid crisis, and thousands more are homeless. So the BC government came up with a plan. Spend nearly half a billion dollars to build and operate more than 2,000 units of modular housing across BC. Modular means the homes are built off-site. So while a traditional construction crew is waiting around for permits, you can almost finish your project in the comfort of your warehouse. When we ship the boxes from our factory, if it's a bedroom for an affordable housing unit, it will have the kitchen and table and chairs, all the light fixtures, the paintings will be on the wall. Once the pre-built homes arrive on site, all that's left to do is stack them up like Lego on top of something called a floating foundation. The process is so quick, this 45-unit complex in Vancouver was built in just 45 days. It's usually up to the municipality to find a piece of land that's suitable to build the housing on. And those land deals typically last anywhere from two to five years. Once that deal expires, the hope is that a more permanent solution will be found. And when that happens, it's just as easy to disassemble these houses as it is to put them up. To be able to disassemble it, relocate it, and set it up in a new location. So within, the, you know, let's call it 60 to 90 days, you could have that facility off the place where it is and set up and ready to operate in its new location. People who are homeless or at risk of becoming homeless get to live in the suites, and the province hires social agencies to come in and run the day-to-day -day operations. Those same social agencies are also often involved in helping people transition from the street to their new homes. So your basics are now there. You can start actually going out of this survival mode of, you know, where am I going to sleep and what am I going to eat to what can my life look like different and, and can I address X, Y, or Z within my life? And people are starting to challenge themselves to do that. Joey, I'd like to show you uh, your new home. Supporters say modular housing is the quickest way to get people off the street, but there's plenty of opposition too. Why this government wants Maple Ridge to shoulder such a disproportionate burden of the homeless crisis? All you gotta do is head to uh, Victoria or head to Nanaimo or go into the Surrey modulars and you see that crime numbers are through the roof, there are arrests and people are continuing to be in a state of addiction and they're dying and that's the bottom line. There have been complaints, protests and even court challenges against modular housing projects but there have also been hundreds of moments like this. Get your thoughts on how it makes you feel. Well, 
it feels like I'm not gonna be homeless. This is this is like Club Med to me. <laughs> so. Jesse Johnston, CBC News. Well, that is it for tonight online, yes. of course. Um, we are going to be on television after the hockey game tonight. Mm -hmm. Probably around, around 7 o'clock, depending on how the game turns out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Overtime, no overtime. Yes. And if you want to catch some more stories, you can tune in. All right. Thanks for watching for now. Have a good night.